Thank you to Fred for inviting me, and thank you to uh, Sharon, Karina, and um, Patty for helping set this up, and to Zach as well. Um, I'm Tim. I was part of that first cohort along with Amanda. Um, I'll be talking about my personal experience, uh, how looking back I feel like the IGERT has helped uh, me in my career. So I graduated from uh, Duke in 2008 with degrees in biomedical and electrical engineering. Um, I actually worked as an engineer for a couple years before kind of missing the rigors of academia and then uh, was looking for graduate programs in the area that combined biology and mathematics, uh, which were my passions. Um, at the time, I thought that was very interdisciplinary. Uh, and I was looking at the mosquitoes that transmit dengue, looking at genetic modification, uh, along with Alan Lloyd and Fred Gould. Uh, and then the IGERT came along about a year later, and I was kind of a natural fit for that. So um, began that in 2012. And I defended in 2015. Uh, and became an uh, assistant professor of statistics and probability at Worcester State. So Worcester is apparently how you pronounce that. Uh, Worcester, Massachusetts is, uh, in central Massachusetts, it calls itself the heart of Massachusetts, even though uh, no one else does. It puts uh, <laughs> hearts on all the street signs. Um, that's me. They asked me, can I actually, okay. So they asked me to take part in a promotional video, so those aren't really my students. But it's a small uh, liberal arts university uh, in Massachusetts, and I'm there teaching statistics and probability. So I just finished my third year there, so this was kind of a good time for me to, to look back and really f reflect on how I felt Eigert has helped me kind of along the way. Um, so let me just start with the educational impact. Uh, the things that, looking back, that I really took away uh, from the Eiger was that it, for the first time, encouraged me to take part in these very non-mathematical discussions. That was a first for me. And I think that's very important for math modelers, understanding the context of the application that they're modeling, right? So understanding the values of the society that you uh, intend to, say, release genetically modified mosquitoes in, and things like the classes, but also the international trip to Peru uh, really helped with that, I felt like. Uh, one class in particular that really stood out to me was the Emerging Technologies and Society class. Uh, this was probably the furthest in terms of discipline from my background, but maybe the one I took the most out of. I, I got a lot out of all the classes and I really liked that, you know, the different students were kind of experts in their, you know, relative fields. Experts, quote unquote. Um, but this one really stood out to me. We read the, the Structure of Scientific Revolutions by Thomas Kuhn in that really kind of changed my world view in a lot of ways. I went from thinking about science as this kind of universally agreed upon foundation of society to uh, more of an enclave in society, uh, a community that kind of creates its own standards and then abides by them. I mean, holds others to them and kind of excludes non-scientific communities from the discussion for being non-scientific. I'm not trying to say it's either a good, good or a bad thing, but it changed the way I kind of looked at science in the context of society. Um, I started using the word publics in the plural. <laughs> and I became, I became really interested in something called the reification fallacy, uh, whereby you take something abstract, like a model, and you start to think of it as its own entity. So you make it more concrete. Um, and that affects the way that you think about it. Um, so I did my semester project on, on reification. I thought it kind of tied into this maybe bigger problem in science of this kind of illusion of objectivity where you see a p-value, or you see a nice quantified graphical result, and you, you tend to trust it. Um, and I, I don't know, I guess I became more skeptical, more critical. So in short, uh, these kind of things taught me to be both you know, a critical thinker and more open-minded, things I thought I was good at, but that Eigert kind of took to a new level. Um, in terms of my professional, uh, the professional impact, so on my career, I can think of a couple examples. I'll give one here, where um, during my job talk, at Worcester State, I was, I was giving a math talk, obviously, but I was uh, deriving something called the, uh, the SIR model. So in, uh, in epidemiology, you have the susceptible, infectious, and recovered model, where you can model the spread of a disease. And 
I had derived the, the critical vaccination fraction. Sorry, I had to throw some math in here. So here you have the critical vaccination fraction PC and how it relates to something called the basic reproductive number, which is essentially how quickly a virus is able to spread um, into a susceptible population. And I was you know, saying how this can be very high for certain diseases. For example, measles has an R0 of about 15. And so this critical vaccination fraction ends up being uh, 93%. And so I was kind of tying this in saying that's why it's so important, you know, and why it's a big issue now with people choosing not to get vaccinated or not getting vaccinated and, um, you know, the resurgence of some of these really dangerous diseases. And I said it in a way that was a little bit dismissive and I kind of caught it myself. I like to think I didn't say the word anti-vaxxers, but I don't exactly remember. Um, but I kind of engaged in something that could have been othering Right, and I didn't think anyone would pick up on it, but somebody, one of the faculty member actually uh, called me out on it and said, well, you know, there are a number of reasons that people don't get vaccinated. There's also accessibility to healthcare issues. And all of a sudden it was like I was in Eigert Colloquium. We were having this like discussion about the societal impacts. And instead of being like really flustered, I kind of found myself able to engage in that discussion. I had definitely been at Colloquia where there was othering. I think that is probably the colloquium that Fred is, is mentioning. Um, which people took offense to. Um, and so some debates had gotten very heated, but I felt like able to engage in that debate, I guess. So I felt that the IGER had really helped prepare me for that. And then some ongoing stuff. Sorry, I don't know how I'm doing on time. I think I'm okay, right? Uh, some ongoing stuff is there's been a big push at Worcester State uh, for promoting civil discourse in the classroom. We have kind of a, a unique makeup of people from Worcester, but also a lot of small farming towns in Massachusetts, which tend to be much more uh, conservative. So we have a big variety of viewpoints in our classrooms and trying to engage in civil discourse, which I think is easy for a math professor in uh, a lot of lecture-based classrooms to sort of shy away from. But I've been going to these workshops about how to kind of have these difficult but important discussions. Uh, so for example, in statistics, I've been talking to criminal justice about publicly available data sets, which you can use pretty um, introductory statistics to look at differences between um, the proportion of people of color who are incarcerated versus those that commit crimes and start to have those kind of difficult but important discussions. Um, at one of those workshops, um, I was talking to a, a criminal justice faculty member um, who's working with uh, really heavy stuff on mass murders, so has been recently working with the FBI on correlations between uh, certain warning signs and school shooters. Um, and I was talking to him at one of these uh, workshops and he kind of mentioned, you know, I think a lot of social scientists tend to overtrust models or gloss over the assumptions. And I was like, yeah, I think it's not just social scientists. Like I think we tend to do that in general and there's this kind of reification fallacy, at least I tried to kind of like tie it into that. But I was able to have this discussion, I think having thought about that and having been through the Iger and, and looking at that kind of broader context of models. Uh, so that was all my perspective. I did, before I came down here, I asked my uh, employer if they could think back to three years ago, my search committee actually, um, when they saw the Iger, what did they think about that? Um, I had to resend them my CV at the time and, and cover letter and all that. And I have to admit, it's a teaching school. And I, I, I realized I kind of tucked the Iger experience onto the second page. I tried to highlight my teaching experiences and, and maybe we can talk about that. So I ended up in a, a very traditional teaching school, and that's maybe one of the potential issues with IGERT is that you forego a lot of the teaching experience in graduate school um, to take these classes and, and do this research. But it still helped me in, in getting this teaching job and that they saw it um, as kind of something different and something valuable to their department. So these are their words. They said the, the experience would be good for their department. Um, that it could help them sell the job to me because of the proximity to UMass Medical. So um, the fact that I had worked in kind of public health was good and having a variety of experiences allowed them to kind of find where I could fit in in that region, if that makes sense. Um, and then lastly, one person told it definitely helped my resume float to the top. And this is specific to the IGERT, not just the variety of experiences. I asked them specifically about the IGERT. So it really did have an impact. Um, it's not just me cliche saying like, oh, it helped me stand out. They, they actually um, kind of confirmed that. 
So if I could be so bold as to make a couple recommendations to other programs that are doing similar things, two things that I think really stand out to me as to why I feel our program was a success. Uh, first, the strong support among the faculty. Um, graduate students have a lot of demands on their time, as do faculty, but if uh, students can continually see their advisor as taking IGRIT seriously and that it's a priority. It doesn't need to be the top priority every week, right? But this kind of consistency of this thing is important. Um, I think that can go a long way. And last, Jason kind of beat me to this, but really strong leadership. I can't really say enough about what Fred did in tying this all together, being very proactive and and bringing so, so many different people to the table, um, but also being so engaged and passionate himself about learning these other disciplines, being very honest about his own gaps in knowledge and his own biases. Um, and also he's known for making us do silly poses in pictures, as you can see. Um, so I'll end it there. If I had to make a recommendation, it would be you know get another Fred and um, the faculty kind of fall into place in, in supporting. Thank you. <laughs>